Now this lecture will cover microbial diseases of the nervous system. So first off, let's talk a little bit about the anatomy of the nervous system. So our nervous system is composed of these two interacting subsystems, the peripheral nervous system or PNS and central nervous system or CNS. The peripheral nervous system is this network of nerves that's going all throughout your body and connecting the central nervous system to all of your muscles and sensory organs and communicating back with the central nervous system. The central nervous system is composed of your brain and your spinal cord. And so we'll go a little bit more in depth about the differences in these systems and what that means for infection. So let's dive a little bit deeper into the central nervous system, specifically talking about the brain. So our brain is very important, of course, right? We need our brains, so our, our body protects our brains very well with lots of different layers. So below the kind of very bony layer of your skull, which you can feel and you can tap your skull, you have three layers of membranes called meninges beneath your skull. And your meninges are composed of your dura mater, arachnoid mater, and pia mater. So those are three layers of membranes that are protecting your brain. And then you also have cerebrospinal fluid. And the cerebrospinal fluid is hanging out between these two layers here, your arachnoid mater and pia mater layers of meninges. Your cerebrospinal fluid is very important for delivering nutrients and removing waste from neural tissue and cleaning up your brain. So I will ask you about the meninges here in this diagram potentially, but I will not ask you about these other parts of the skull. So yes, the brain is very well protected and it has another layer of protection called the blood brain barrier. And the blood brain barrier protects your cerebrospinal fluid from contamination. There are lots of things that get into our body and cause contamination, right? But we're talking about microbiology and the blood brain barrier does a great job of protecting your central nervous system from things like microbial pathogens. And thanks to that blood brain barrier, there are no normal microbiota in your central nervous system. So that means that your brain and your spinal cord should have no microbes present. They're completely sterile. But that being said, infections can happen in these areas. And when infections do happen, they're very difficult to treat because the blood brain barrier is great at keeping out things that shouldn't be there like microbial pathogens, but that also means it's pretty great at blocking uh, treatments as well. Drugs are not able to easily access the blood brain barrier either. So those infections are very difficult to treat. And then to cause an infection, a pathogen has to breach that blood brain barrier. It has to enter the spinal cord, gain access to the cerebrospinal fluid. And one way that it's able to do that is actually called the Trojan horse method. And certain pathogens can intracellularly infect cells so they can like infect a white blood cell and that white blood cell can gain access to the central nervous system and then that pathogen has gotten past it has snuck past your immune system gained access to the um, past the blood-brain barrier to your cerebral spinal fluid so that's one possible way that infection can occur and now the PNS or peripheral nervous system so the peripheral nervous system are all of your nerves that connect your organs and your limbs and everything to your central nervous system, to your brain and your spinal cord for all of that communication with all of the other stuff that's happening in your body. Your peripheral nervous system, though, is not protected by meninges, those three layers of membranes that protect your brain and spinal cord, and it's not protected by, by a blood-brain barrier. So what do you think this means? For the susceptibility of the peripheral nervous system to infection, it is much more likely to experience infection than the central nervous system. It just does not have as many layers of protection. A kind of general uh, outcome of infection of the peripheral nervous system is something called neuropathy. And this can be an outcome of microbial damage to those peripheral nerves and damage to those nerves can lead to numbness and tingling in the peripheral nervous system. And of course, this damage could, uh, you can get neuropathy from a lot of different things than microbial damage, like trauma and drugs and diseases and everything. But we're talking about microbiology, and neuropathy can potentially be a result of microbial damage of the peripheral nervous system as well.
Now zooming in even further uh, to the peripheral nervous system and central nervous system, what cells make up these systems? So the peripheral nervous system and central nervous system are composed of cells called glial cells and neurons or nerve cells. This is interchangeable, neurons, nerve cells. Glial cells are really important for organizing the functions of neurons, but it's your neurons that are responsible for actually transmitting signals throughout the body and actually communicating with the organs, with your central nervous system, between your peripheral nervous system, with muscles, and kind of organizing everything that's happening in your body. And then a neuron has many parts to it. So it has a soma or cell body. This is where the nucleus is going to be. It has these branched extensions off the cell body called dendrites. This is how it's going to attach and kind of communicate with other neurons. And then it has this long axon, and the axon is where the electrochemical signal is actually going to be transmitted, and it's going to send a signal to another neuron. And the axon can be coded in something called a myelin sheath, and the myelin sheath just helps the signal transmission happen more effectively. And then how do these cells or neurons communicate with each other? They communicate at these areas where they uh, connect called synapses. It's at these synaptic terminals where these chemicals called neurotransmitters that are inside of these neurons are released and then bind to the next neuron. And then that potentially elicits a response from that neuron to fire and then release that electrochemical signal down the axon and release neurotransmitters. And then that signal is passed from neuron to neuron to neuron. And that's how nerves fire and release these signals to cause a reaction at distal parts of the body or send a signal back to the central nervous system. So before we talk about specific examples of bacterial and viral infections of the nervous system, just be familiar with some terminology. So men meningitis and encephalitis are really important when we're talking about the nervous system. Because as we said already, our skull provides a lot of protection. It protects our brain, but that also means if there's any type of swelling or pressure happening in the brain because of inflammation of the brain or the meninges, those membranes that co cover our brain, that can lead to intracranial pressure. And this can lead to brain damage. So some examples of those structures that are inflamed would be meningitis, the inflammation of the meninges, encephalitis, the inflammation of brain tissue, and meningioencephalitis, inflammation of both the meninges and the brain tissue. And of course, all three types of inflammation here can of course be caused by microbial pathogens that have passed the blood-brain barrier and gotten to the central nervous system, but also just know that these can be caused by non-pathogenic uh, causes too, like head trauma and cancer and drugs and so on. Now to determine if this inflammation is caused by a pathogen, most commonly there's going to be a sample of cerebrospinal fluid taken and then you're also going to be tested for white blood cell counts and protein levels to determine what your immune system is doing. And then the cerebrospinal fluid sample can also be cultured to see if there is um, a bacterial component present. Here's an outline of the different bacterial diseases of the nervous system we're going to talk about over the next several slides. So we'll talk about some examples of bacterial meningitis, like meningococcal meningitis, pneumococcal men meningitis, and haemophilus influenza type B. So these are all can cause bacterial meningitis. And meningitis, remember, is the inflammation of the meninges. We'll also talk about clostridium-associated diseases like tetanus and botulism, and then Hansen's disease or leprosy. First off, bacterial meningitis. And we'll see that bacterial meningitis is one of the most serious forms of meningitis. We'll also talk about viral meningitis, but bacterial meningitis is most serious. And most commonly, bacteria is going to cause meningitis and get to the uh, central nervous system through the bloodstream as a result of some kind of trauma that's happened. And many of the bacteria that can cause meningitis are found in healthy people, so this is an opportunistic infection. So some examples of bacteria that can cause meningitis are Neisseria meningitis, Streptococcus pneumoniae, and Haemophilus influenza. So these are all commonly found in respiratory secretions actually, and they can all be part of our normal microbiota.
And just so you see what this bacteria can potentially do to the central nervous system, I have these images down here. The left shows a healthy brain, and then the right shows the result of someone that died from bacterial meningitis. And you can see the hem hemorrhaging and the pus formation. And the pus would be a result of bacteria that has virulence factors like leukocytins to kill white blood cells. And it's those virulence factors that allow this bacteria to lead to an active infection in this tissue. So our first example is meningococcal meningitis. And this is an infection caused by the bacteria Neisseria meningitidis. And this used to be a lot more common in younger populations, but fortunately that has become more and more rare thanks to the meningococcal vaccine. So there is a vaccine available that prevents the infection with this bacteria. Neisseria meningitidis pathogenicity is increased by certain virulence factors. So like we've seen again and again, bacteria has virulence factors that allows it to replicate more easily, evade the immune system, and lead to an infection. Neisseria meningitidis, because it is gram-negative, it has this LPS endotoxin. So in its outer membrane, it has LPS, which has lipid A, which our immune systems do not like. It has special pili for attachment to host tissues, and it can also have a capsule. It can have that special glycocalyx to avoid phagocytosis from those white blood cells. Commonly, people that um, have this infection develop a potential rash, and this appears soon after the disease onset, and this is caused by the bacteria releasing those endotoxins, and it's a result of your immune system reacting to that endotoxin. This can result in sepsis and organ failure, so that just means that this infection can potentially disseminate throughout the body. It can be transmitted further to other areas of the body through the bloodstream and lead to a more extreme immune response. And this infection can progress very rapidly. So like I mentioned before, this is something that's going to be detected with cerebros uh, a collection of cerebrospinal fluid and sampling of the blood and culturing of those. And then very early and aggressive treatment with antibiotics is crucial. Now pneumococcal meningitis. And this is caused by the bacteria Streptococcus pneumoniae. And this is a gram-positive bacteria. And Streptococcus pneumoniae actually colonizes up to 70% of young children. It's a lot less common in adults, but it's, it's a part of the normal microbiota of young children. And so this means that pneumococcal meningitis is going to be a lot more common in children, uh, most often people that are two months of age to adulthood. So before you're an adult, but over two months. That's kind of the most common time that people develop um, pneumococcal meningitis. And then there are two pneumococcal vaccines available, fortunately. So there is a pneumococcal conjugate vaccine and a pneumococcal polysaccharide vaccine. And that is fantastic because that lowers the incidence of pneumococcal meningitis in those populations. And this, like before, is identified, identified using cerebrospinal fluid samples and also gram stains to determine uh, after this sample has been collected to determine the gram state of the bacteria that's in this sample, and also PCR, polymerase chain reaction, if you remember that from the genetics extra credit. And this type of bacteria, Streptococcus pneumoniae, is really commonly uh, broadly drug resistant, unfortunately, so it, it most often needs to be treated with broad spectrum antibiotics, so we don't have a narrow spectrum or very specific antibiotic to specifically treat Streptococcus pneumoniae when there is an infection happening. And Streptococcus pneumoniae does have specific virulence factors that allow it to evade our immune systems. So it has pili for attachment. It interferes with immune responses by releasing certain enzymes. And it also uh, it does have a conjugate vaccine available, so it can develop a capsule. And that's what that conjugate vaccine is for, is to prevent that capsule from being able to evade the immune response. And it can also release exotoxins that trigger a more exaggerated immune response as well. And then finally, Haemophilus influenza type B. So this is caused by Haemophilus influenza serotype B, or HIB, and this is a gram-negative bacteria. Now, fortunately, this is very uncommon. This infection is very uncommon due to the HIB vaccine. So without this vaccine available, Haemophilus influenza was actually the most common cause of bacterial meningitis. 
but now we have this vaccine. As we've seen with the other two examples of bacterial meningitis, these vaccines are available and fantastic for reducing the incidence of meningitis in these populations. But when, an, when infection does occur, it is able to be treated with antibiotic courses, but the best way you prevent infection is with the HIV vaccine for this one and for the vaccines for the other ones we talked about as well. So as we've seen though, um, again and again, Haemophilus does have these virulence factors that allow it to evade our immune system. It does have an endotoxin, it's gram negative, so it has LPS and lipid A in that outer membrane. It's able to adhere and attach to specific respiratory cells. It's actually, um, that's the type of specific cell it is invading. And then it is able to form a capsule as well and resist phagocytosis. Also, you commonly are going to use a cerebrospinal fluid sample to, um, ca to check if an infection is present, and they can also be determined through PCR. Now we'll talk about a couple examples of clostridium-associated diseases. So we'll talk about tetanus and botulism. So first off, we have tetanus. Tetanus is caused by the bacterium Clostridium tetani, and this is a non-communicable disease, so it is not transmitted from human to human. And it's characterized by these uncontrollable muscle spasms that are caused by the release of this neurotoxin from this bacteria called tetanus neurotoxin, and it's uh, shortened to T-E-N-T, -E tetanus neurotoxin. This can be a localized infection and just affect muscle groups that were near the site of injury or infection with the bacteria, or it can be more generalized and it can spread to other parts and tissues of the body. And this can be very serious once this uh, neurotoxin has spread to other parts of the body. Because what tetanus neurotoxin is doing is preventing neurons from releasing neurotransmitters required for muscle relaxation. So it causes muscles to seize up. And this can lead to a characteristic symptom, you've probably heard of this before, lockjaw. And this is when the muscles in your face and your jaw are not able to relax, they're seized, and you're not able to open your mouth. So it's called lockjaw. This is diagnosed by detecting this neurotoxin, tetanus neurotoxin, in feces and blood, and it is treated with antibiotic therapy and this to target the bacteria, clostridium tetani, but also the antitoxin for the neurotoxin as well. There is a vaccine available called the, called the tetanus toxoid vaccine, and that's going to be the most effective way to prevent and avoid infection. And this uh, toxoid vaccine is sensitizing your immune system to the toxoid or to the toxin, tetanus neurotoxin, that this bacterium is making. And we learned about that, if you recall. Our next example of a clostridium associated disease is botulism, and this disease is caused by the bacteria Clostridium botulinum. And this is very rare, but it is often very fatal as well. And that is from this bacteria producing another type of neurotoxin. So last we saw was tetanus neurotoxin, but now we have botulinum neurotoxin, B-O-N-T, botulinum neurotoxin. And botulism, or this uh, bacterium that causes this disease, botulism, can be introduced into the body lots of different ways, from ingestion through food, inhalation in the air, through breaking that first line of defense by needles or wounds, for example. What's happening with this botulinum neurotoxin is that it's binding to the presynaptic membrane of a neuron, and it's not allowing that neuron to communicate with other neurons. So it's uh, preventing the release of these neurotransmitters, and this leads to the paralysis of muscle tissue. And botulinum neurotoxin can be treated with an antitoxin, but you need to act fast. So as soon as you recognize the infection, you need to be immediately treated with the antitoxin because the antitoxin stops the progression of paralysis and the uh, kind of clogging of these presynaptic membranes, but it can't reverse it. So paralysis is kind of not reversible once it has progressed to a certain degree. And there are currently no vaccines to prevent botulism compared to the tetanus neurotoxin. There is the tetanus toxoid vaccine, but there is no vaccine available for botulism. So the last bacterial infection of the nervous system we'll talk about is Hansen's disease or leprosy. So these are interchangeable. And this is caused by the bacteria Mycobacterium leprae, and this is a gram-positive bacteria. 
And this bacteria is going to affect the peripheral nervous system, or PNS, and it can lead to permanent damage of those nerves, loss of sensation, or potential loss of those appendages. This disease is communicable, so it can potentially be transmitted from person to person, but it's not very contagious, so you need to be in very close contact for a long period of time in order to transmit this disease from person to person. This bacteria grows best in the peripheral tissue, which makes sense as well because it affects the peripheral nervous system, but it grows better at lower temperatures, so uh, your appendages that are more kind of distal from your core, like your fingers, ears, and nose. And then uh, Mycobacterium leprae does also have important virulence factors that allow it to infect and evade the immune system. So it is able to form a capsule, that outer glycocalyx that pre prevents phagocytosis. And it also has a lot of binding factors that allow it to specifically bind to cells of the nervous system and then killing those neurons that is, that is leading to that numbness and that neuropathy. Initial symptoms after infection with this bacteria can take a long time to develop, so they may not appear for two to five years after this bacteria has infected the nervous system. And diagnosis is going to require a skin biopsy or the use of PCR. And this disease does respond very well to treatment when diagnosed early. So because of the dramatic increase of um, checking for the incidence and presence of this disease in populations over the last like 30 years or so, this disease has dr dramatically declined because it has been tested for, um, especially for populations that are more at risk. And there is no uh, definitive vaccine for this disease, but actually it is, it has been observed that in populations that are more likely to experience tuberculosis um, are actually more likely to also experience Hansen's disease or leprosy. And the vaccine that's used for tuberculosis is actually uh, kind of effective for a leprosy as well. So that's one of those vaccines that is kind of used, but there is no specific vaccine only for leprosy. Now we'll discuss a few examples of viral diseases of the nervous system. So we'll talk about viral meningitis and compare that a bit with bacterial meningitis. We'll talk about Zika virus infection and rabies. First off with some info about viral meningitis, and I think I mentioned this earlier, but just so you know, viral meningitis is one, a lot more common than bacterial meningitis, and two, a lot less severe compared to bacterial meningitis. Serious cases of viral meningitis can occur, it's just a lot less frequent and less likely to happen when the infection is caused by a virus compared to bacteria. So an example of this, similar to viral meningitis, so encephalitis is talking about the infection of brain tissue, meningitis is talking about the infection of the meninges, but those infections can kind of transfer from one place to another. So this we'll talk about specifically types of arboviral encephalitis. And it's an arbovirus, so that means it is insect-borne, that's what that uh, refers to. And this is going to be types of viruses that are transmitted by insects and cause encephalitis or inflammation of the brain tissue. Different types of arboviral encephalitis diseases found in the United States are things like Eastern Equine Encephalitis, EEE, Western Equine Encephalitis, WEE, St. Louis Encephalitis, and West Nile Encephalitis. So in most cases, actually, when someone is infected with this virus, they are asymptomatic, or the disease is very mild. You don't know you really have it. You may think you have like a flu or the cold or something like that. But, and this would be for individuals that are healthy and have properly working immune systems. People that are immunocompromised, of course, may experience a more intense version of the disease. And the most common biological vector, because again, we're thinking insect-borne, it's transmitted by insects. The most common biological vector for arboviruses is mosquitoes. And then the best prevention, of course, to avoid getting arboviral diseases is to protect yourself from mosquitoes. So use insect repellent, wear long sleeves, use screens when um, outdoors, eat in screened areas, things like that. Diagnosis is most often going to be through serological testing, and this should look fami uh, familiar. So serological testing is testing to see 
if your immune system has made antibodies against this specific type of virus. So you're detecting if you have created antibodies towards it. And there are no antiviral drugs available to treat these diseases. Again, one, because viruses are difficult to develop drugs specifically to treat because they're so closely related to the um, development and replication cycles of our cells, but also because they aren't super relevant in terms of like mortality rate. Most often infections are asymptomatic or the disease is very mild. Now on to Zika virus infections. And Zika virus infe infections are also arboviruses. So they're transmitted by insects, specifically the mosquito for Zika virus infection. And these infections are associated with human illness in specific regions like Africa, Southeast Asia, and South and Central America. But this range has kind of expanded a bit. Infections have been observed in other parts of the world. So the first case in the United States, for example, was observed in 2016. In most cases, Zika virus infections are going to be very mild or asymptomatic. You may not even know you are infected with the virus. And this is similar to what we just saw with the arboviral encephalitis diseases. But with Zika virus, it is very relevant in terms of pregnant women. This virus can be transmitted across the placenta. And this virus can potentially lead to something called microcephaly in the fetus. So this is an abnormally small head, and this results in brain damage. So this is a very um, real and serious issue in terms of the Zika virus infection, especially considering there is no antiviral treatment or vaccine specifically for the Zika virus. So what I said on the previous slide, for preventing arboviral infections is very relevant for Zika virus, especially for pregnant women, to use um, to wear long sleeves and use repellents for insects and mosquitoes and to protect yourselves from areas where this is more common in certain parts of the world. And then our last example for a viral infection of the nervous system is rabies. And rabies is a deadly zoonotic disease, so it is transmitted from animals to humans most commonly and the virus that is causing rabies is the rabies virus and this is like i said a very deadly disease and this virus attaches to and replicates inside of specifically nerve cells and central the, the central nervous system cells so it causes this um, aggressive and rapid inflammation of the central nervous system like your brain and your spinal cord this virus does have a really interesting bullet shape. I think this is interesting. This is a micrograph, so an image from a microscope, and you can see it does have this very specific shape. And then its genetic material, its RNA, is kind of helical and wrapping around inside of that capsid. Most commonly, the rabies virus is going to be transmitted by the animal reservoirs, raccoons, and bats. And it is a very sporadic disease, so it's very uncommon especially in the United States, only one or two human cases a year in the United States. But in other parts of the world, like Asia and Africa, it's a lot more common. There could potentially be thousands of cases. There are so few cases in the United States because of our regulations for vaccinating cats and dogs against the rabies virus. So by limiting this intermediate um, vector, the, the animal that's causing, that's leading to this zoonotic transmission to humans, we're able to limit the incidence and lower the incidence in our population. And then finally, we'll talk about a few examples of fungal and parasitic infections of the nervous system. So we'll talk about cryptococcal meningitis. So this is an example of a fungal infection of the nervous system. And then we'll also talk about amoebic meningitis and neurocystic urcosis. First, cryptococcal meningitis, and this is an example of a fungal infection of the nervous system, and this is called a neuromycosis, because remember, mycosis means a fungal infection, so neuromycosis is a fungal infection of the nervous system. Cryptococcal meningitis is caused by a fungi called Cryptococcus neoformans. So this is a fungal pathogen that can cause meningitis. And meningitis is inflammation of the meninges, those membranes covering the brain. 
This type of fungi is commonly found in soil and also in pigeon droppings. And it has this very thick capsule. So this is an example of a virulence factor that this fungi has. A very thick capsule to avoid phagocytosis. And you can see in this image down here, you can see it has a very thick capsule, this kind of cleared region around these kind of darker green circles are the capsule. It can be easily cultured and identified by its capsule. So that's how this infection is identified by culturing it and then doing a capsule stain to see if this very distinctive capsule is present. And then it's treated with prolonged doses of antifungal drugs. So remember, fungi, like us, is a eukaryote. So one, it's, a, it's, it's more difficult to develop drugs that specifically target this eukaryote. And two, it's going to have a hard time crossing the blood-brain barrier. So this long treatment regi regimen over a long period of time with very low doses is required. So it's not toxic to humans, but it's enough of a low dose over a long period of time to clear the infection. Now this is an example of a parasitic infection of the nervous system, and this is amoebic meningitis, or primary amoebic meningitis, PAM. You may also see it as primary amoebic meningioencephalitis, so it can infect the meninges and uh, cause inflammation there. It can also cause inflammation of the meninges and the brain tissue, and this is caused by Nigleria fowleri. And this is a type of amoeba that can commonly be found in soil and water, especially warmer water. And this, is going, this infection is going to be very rare, and it's most commonly going to be the result of individuals that have gone swimming in fresh, warm bodies of water, like springs. And this pathogen, uh, this amoeba enters through the nose, so when you've gone swimming and this uh, pathogen is in the water, that water gets in your nose, and then that pathogen can take the direct route from your nose and then up the olfactory nerve and directly to your brain. And so because it is kind of direct access to the brain, this disease is usually extremely rapid and infection and, a de and death occurs within just days. Often not in time for a di diagnosis to happen. So diagnosis will commonly happen after um, death and will happen during the autopsy. There are some experimental drugs that are available for treatment, but because this infection does move so quickly, treatment's very difficult. Most often it's going to be fatal. And this, like us, is a eukaryote, so it is difficult to develop drugs that do target this pathogen. But there are a few, I think maybe two or three examples of people that have survived this infection. And of course, their treatment plan and their journey through the disease has been monitored and documented to try to understand how to develop drugs to prevent death from this in the future. Our last example for a parasitic infection of the nervous system is neurocystic ercosis. And this is a parasitic infection caused by the larval form of the pork tapeworms. So this is Tania solium. So this is something that can be found in undercooked pork, this pork tapeworm. And this parasite infects brain and spinal cord tissue again, so we're talking about the central nervous system, and can lead to adult onset epilepsy because of the damage to that nervous tissue. It does have another interesting life cycle for a parasite. I always think parasitic life cycles are interesting. So eggs are ingested, and then they hatch in the intestine. Adult Tapeworms then produce the larvae that are going to move throughout the body, get into the blood, get into the tissues, and eventually get to the central nervous system where it can have access to the spinal cord and the brain. This is diagnosed and detected using brain scans like MRIs and CT scans, and this is looking for the presence of these cysts in the brain tissue. And then you can also detect levels of eosinophils. So this is the type of white blood cell that's going to indicate a parasitic infection. And treatment is really going to be dependent, dependent on how extensive that infection is. So you can uh, get antihelminthic chemotherapy. So you can get regimens of, chemo of drugs that are going to target helminths. But again, those drugs are kind of difficult to develop and they have to be given over a long period of time in small doses because this is a eukaryote like us 
and a potential surgical intervention to remove cysts from the brain.